There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a review of a brand new novella being published today where I am, May 27th, 2021, and it is called What Willow Says by Lynn Buckle, an Irish author, and I was given a re review copy by the publisher Epoch Press in exchange for an honest review, and that's why I'm here. Honestly, I loved it. It was unlike anything I've ever read. When my reading buddy, the Irish novelist Ronan Hessian, recommended Lynn Buckle's first novel to me, The Groundsman, I was shy about trying it because he said that it was very much of a kind of mythological exploration or mythological fiction, and I have an allergy to myth in my fiction. So I was also a little nervous when the publisher approached me, thanks to my connection with Ronan Hessian, I believe, offering me a review copy of this Lynn Buckle's second novel, What Willow Says. Well, I think maybe Lynn Buckle has cured me of my allergy towards mythology, or else she just handles it inevitably, and whatever the explanation is, I loved the way Irish mythology undergirds so much of this story. So this 128-page novella is about a grandmother, I think she's a very young grandmother, and her eight-year-old granddaughter who is deaf. Nobody is named in the novel, so we've got the grandmother and the granddaughter. There is a lot of basic information that one typically expects in a novel, in a work of fiction, that is withheld or simply not there in this story. So we don't know anybody's names. There are allusions to a lot of death in this family. This young grandmother has lost her husband and her daughter, the granddaughter's mother. The story is set near the Bog of Allen, which I believe is in County Kildare. That is where the author lives, and the setting is almost the entire story. The natural setting. I haven't read much about bogs, and boy, I don't know what the opposite of bogged down is, but I was bogged up, um, sinking into, excuse the pun, I don't know how else to say this, googling everything about the Bog of Allen and about bogs in general and peat and the mythology of the Bog of Allen and other Irish bogs. It was just absolutely fascinating. And this story is, again, I want to say this story sinks into all of that mythology and all of that natural setting. The young grandmother is an artist and she has been compiling a kind of an encyclopedia, a visual an artistic record of all of the trees in her area, and she's taking care of. It was never quite clear to me whether the granddaughter was living with her or just often visiting. Those kind of very basic details just don't seem to matter for this story to work its magic on you. But she's the grandmother is struggling to learn sign language and failing miserably at it. The granddaughter is a little bit impatient with grandma. She should be learning a little bit more, but they communicate with their own private sign language and a lot of very personal, uh, richly described workarounds. And that is a large part of this story as well. The grandmother is challenged by her granddaughter. She is so deeply touched by the way her deaf grandchild moves through the world independently, resistant to getting the high-powered hearing aids, the is that cochlear implants that might enable her to become a hearing person. The grandmother supports her granddaughter in whatever she decides, but there's a lot about deaf politics that was fascinating to read about. Uh, Lynn Buckle herself is a deaf person. The main narrative here is how the grandmother and the granddaughter communicate and commune with the natural world. The central project that is suggested, if not demanded, by this delightful eight-year-old girl is she wants to know what willow trees say. That's the title, What Willow Says. She wants to know what it sounds like when the wind moves through the willow trees in the backyard 
and what it means. Well, that is a challenge for anybody to explain or describe or certainly translate into words. And that is the central project that grandmother and granddaughter embark on. In fact, they embark on several day trips and wandering around along the bog and near the, the pond. And there's all kinds of stuff about various natural settings and hiking and so on. With all of the attendant mythology, uh, gorgeously described uh, settings, and this fabulously inquisitive eight-year-old granddaughter with her questions and her challenges to her grandmother. What, what does it mean? What does it sound like? Tell me, tell me. And it's absolutely beautiful to read. It's 130 pages, and I read it so slowly because it was just so rich. So I think the best thing that I can do to sell you on this is to read you one of the short chapters. The structure of the novel is quirky and wonderful. It is in the form of very short chapters, which are called entries. They have kind of a memo, memorandum-like quality. It starts entry number blah, and then what is the wind, what is the weather, and what is the outlook? And then this very poetic, lush, at times whimsical, at other times very plaintive, emotionally raw writing. And I'm going to read you a short one. This is entry number four. So like I say, it starts with what's the wind, what's the weather, what's the outlook, and then it goes into this entry, which is among other things, is mainly about the second encounter, about what are the willow trees saying. The italicized print is what the grandmother understands that the granddaughter is saying to her by their own private sign language or whatever um, she can understand about the standard sign language. Three pieces of vocabulary that I'd like to make sure to cover off before we dive in. Scytherism, here's the spelling, I think I'm pronouncing it right. I've heard some people try to pronounce the P sound, Psytherism, but I think Scytherism is what I, how I will pronounce it. I found several pronunciations that did that. Scytherism means the sound of rustling leaves, the sound of the wind blowing through the trees. Scytherism, I love that word. That might be a new favorite word. And this Irish word, meaning lullaby, suntre is the pronunciation I found. And in the same sentence that mentions Scytherism is another word that I'd heard, but I didn't know what it meant. And that is stridulation. So a stridulation is the sound that insects make when they rub their legs together or whatever, like, like a cricket or whatever. I think that we're good to go. Entry number four. Wind. No air. Moving slowly. Weather. Fine. 31 degrees Celsius. Outlook. A likelihood of understanding trees is not high. Washed out skies, faded lawns, colors diluted as summer is drawn and stretched by a heat wave. The night was hot early morning warmer. By eleven it was scorching. We learned to shut doors against heat and wallow through still air. The eight-year-old's feet leave sweaty prints. I try not to sleep. Under the shade of the garden willows she draws, in pale chalks on brittle papers of sheep in winter snow. Asked why, she says it is to feel the cold better, and draws me polar bears at night. Do they have trees in Antarctica? They might if she has anything to do with it. She feels sorry for the opposing poles, she says, when I explain magnetic repulsion, all that resistance. What about the isolation? Polar bears like that. They can eat more fish. This is just enough to keep me awake. By the time the noontide moon and sun share opposite sides of the sky, she is in need of feeding. We carry a picnic basket over stiles, across the park, over starched grass, to our usual position. There stands a weeping willow. It is all sweeping fronds and curtained shadow. It has Salix Babylonica stamped onto a black label on its trunk. We sit underneath, among cigarette papers and cider bottles and metal rings dug into the ground. She asks me what the tree thinks of the state it is living in. It doesn't. How do you know? I want to sleep, not explain anthropomorphic tendencies or give botanical references from Latin dictionaries. Listen. Tell me what it says. I shut my eyes and concentrate on noises. The tree may as well not be there. 
I hear traffic, I tell her, before breaking it down into cars and lorries going over speed bumps, even a bus. I'm getting good at this. Birds, too, lots of them, talking to each other, fighting and chirping and singing. And the river, I can hear that, too. I open my eyes to see hers are wide and realize just how much she is missing. The tree, again. I expect a swishing sound. Nothing. I pretend, say I can hear Sutri, the music of sleep and meditation. She knows I am kidding as we lie back and look up through the domed canopy against the sun. What do you think it sounds like? Insects. And it says, I hide your rubbish. Come on, let us do every tree in the park. One of them must be talking. I want to find the stridulations which she imagines, the sitherisms of rustling leaves, their sighs and modulations, if they have them. I hear nothing. We go from pine to fir to rowan and silver birch, elder, alder, and larch, from horse chestnuts bearing early fruits to Irish oaks with neat round trunks. Each of them already features in my anthology of trees. They were smaller then, when I knew even less about identification keys and hybridization, and there were many duplicates drawn in my confusion. She is throwing silent shapes, drawing names for them in the air, her hand movements so much more descriptive than the words we share. Inventions born of observations. She already knows the slow, steadfast way an oak tree grows, or how eucalyptus rushes to the sky in the fight for light, how aspen quivers and ivy gropes. Our vocabulary expands at her invention, our very own sign language. I should not build confusion, should adhere to official Irish sign language, should be one step ahead, should facilitate standardization. I don't. She is too beautiful to correct, so we adopt her signs and save learning conventions for later. Not one tree murmurs during our study. What are leaves for if not stealing sunlight or harmonies from breezes? The acoustics of village life predominate. I hear her small breaths panting through thick air. I fill her with liquids, fearful of fainting and 31 degrees Celsius heat strokes. She assures me we will hear the trees with practice. Ah, so the writing is rich. I loved the descriptions of the natural life and the emotional connection and the advocacy for deaf liberation and the protest against the environmental challenges in the area where this story is set. What rich language. I do an occasional series on my channel called In Other Words where I talk about the words that I encounter in my reading and I will be doing a, a list as long as my arm of all the words that I found out about in this book. If you liked the excerpt I read, if you like nature writing, if you are interested in issues around deafness in literature and in life, this is a novella that I recommend with all of my heart because it actually was a book that got inside of me. If you are a reader who needs some of those basic elements of storytelling that I talked about being withheld here, and you need a whole bunch of standard stuff to happen in your fiction, this may not be a book for you. I was absolutely delighted to discover that it was a book very much for me. I look forward to reading Lynn Buckle's first novel and following her writing career. And when you get to the end of the story and you find out what the Sitherisms mean, what the Willows are saying, there are no words. All of the words there are are in What Willow Says. Thanks for watching. Thank you.